I think I'll do the introductions to the speakers uh, right now, um, rather than interrupting the flow of the talks a little bit later. So, uh, again, we've uh, another astounding uh, lineup of speakers this morning for the, this penultimate session, which is titled "Light Exposure and the and the Retina." Uh, our first speaker is going to be Professor Barbara Klein, uh, who's a fellow at the American College of Preventive Medicine uh, at the American Academy of Ophthalmology and the American Academy of Epidemiology. Uh, she's a professor at the University of Wisconsin in the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences. Uh, her research interests current here uh, include epidemiology of age-related macular degeneration, cataracts, other retinal conditions, glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, uh, some c other complications of diabetes, uh, and then other aspects including falls and fractures. Uh, she can cite uh, an astounding 600 plus peer reviewed publications. And she tells me what you might be interested to know is that her favorite food is ice cream. Uh, maybe not high in, in macular carotenoids, but uh, good nonetheless. She's gonna to speak to us this morning on the relationships of cataract, cataract extraction, light exposure, and AMD. Uh, our next speaker will be Professor Richard Bone, who again needs no real introduction. Uh, Professor Bone joined the faculty at Florida International University in 1980, uh, where he's currently a professor in the Department of Physics. As we all know, he joined forces with Dr. Landrum in the early 80s, resulting in the first definitive identification of macular pigment. He's currently working on improved methods of measuring macular pigment optical density and on the distribution of light on the retina, um, and that will be the topic of today's talk. Uh, which is about light distribution on the retina implications for AMD. Uh, Professor Bond didn't tell me what his favourite foods were, but uh, I seem to remember a, a strong liking for the key, key lime pie at the Macular Pigment Arvo dinners, so I'd say that's probably up there. Um, our final speaker then is Professor Randy Hammond. He's a professor in the Neurosciences Programme at the University of Georgia. He triple majored in Biology, anthrop Anthropology and Psychology at the University of Oregon. After receiving his PhD in neurosciences, he worked at Harvard Medical School um, and ultimately ended up working uh, essentially as a postdoc with Max Notterly. His first academic appointment was at Arizona State University and has now been at UGA for over a decade. Uh, his main research area is in behavioral medicine and in particular the role of lifestyle in chronic disease. Um, Professor Hammond is going to be speaking on macular carotenoids and visual performance. Uh, likewise, he didn't tell me what his favorite food were, but I did notice that the punting is a, a, definitely a strong affinity for red wine over white wine. So, um, Okay, so I think we'll um, go to Professor Klein. I got it. Oh. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Um, this is really a privilege and an honor, and I need to thank uh, all involved in making this really delightful um, and fun as well as uh, very informational. Um, my talk this morning is somewhat different from what you've been hearing in topic and also um, the, in discipline, but uh, we'll see where we go from here. Um, so, uh, as you know, the, I, I'm going to talk about this morning about cataract and cataract extraction and its, their relationship to age-related uh, macular degeneration. Um, and uh, just to give you a little bit of the background, um, age-related macular degeneration, or I'll call it AMD, is becoming more uh, common in virtually all countries um, with the increasing longevity worldwide. There are effective treatments, as you're aware, for the late-stage um, neovascular AMD, um, but the treatment is very expensive in the U.S. and always involves uh, intraocular injections with all the attendant risks of doing an invasive procedure. Um, at the moment, there's no accepted uh, successful treatment for atrophic AMD. Age-related cataract, or ARC, is the most common age-related eye disease in the world. Um, uh, it is the most uh, common cause of significant visual impairment and legal blindness everywhere. Um, and although some people feel as though it's not much of a problem in the Western world, the cost for cataract surgery, aside from the discomfort and fears that it engenders, has been estimated to cost more than $3 billion um, of the Medicare budget in the U.S. So it's certainly a significant um, health cost in many ways. Um, now, age-related cataract and macular degeneration often occur together by virtue of the fact that, that they are both um, diseases of older people. I'm going to run through, um, in very fast pace, a number of studies that suggest there might be a relationship. Um, there was a combined cross-sectional um, 
uh, effort for, of the data from several projects that, from the uh, Baltimore group, namely the Salisbury Eye Evaluation Project, Proyecto there, and the Baltimore Eye uh, Survey. Um, and this uh, pooled um, analysis indicated an odds ratio of 1.7, or 70% increase, um, in the risk of late macular degeneration associated um, with uh, a history of cataract surgery. Um, severe cataract itself was associated with an odds ratio of 1.4 for late AMD. Uh, another combined study uh, using data from both the Beaver Dam Eye Study and the Blue Mountains Eye Study indicated um, an odds ratio of 5.7 for late AMD associated with cataract surgery at the baseline exam of these two large population-based studies. Um, by a 10-year follow-up um, in the Beaver Dam Eye Study population, the odds ratio um, was 3.81. You see the confidence intervals fairly wide. And the same, similar for the uh, Blue Mountain study where they found 3.3. Again, a significant value, but a relatively large um, confidence interval. At 10 years, the odds ratio for neovascular AMD were greater than for geographic atrophy. Another uh, study called the Visual Impairment Project that was done in Melbourne indicated no association of cataract surgery with progression of AMD. And the age-related eye study, which you've heard lots about at this meeting, um, found no significant effect of cataract surgery during that clinical trial on incident late stages of AMD. And the um, authors of that paper went to great lengths um, to, to, to find a relationship because of the accumulated experience in other studies. Um, now, there are other studies that address these issues. Um, any cataract at baseline or just nuclear cataract alone was associated with incident early AMD in the 10-year incidence data from Beaver Dam with an odds ratio of 1.3 that was statistically significant. You can see the tighter confidence interval because uh, early AMD is much more common. Um, cataract surgery was not significantly associated with incident late AMD. Not cataract surgery, sorry, cataract itself with late AMD at the 10-year follow-up in Beaver Dam. Um, cataract surgery was associated with AM, late AMD and each of the component lesions individually, but it was not significantly associated with early AMD. And no cataract type nor cataract surgery was associated with early or late AMD in recent data from the Beijing eye study. So the question that uh, is of great interest to me is, does age-related cataract itself increase the risk of developing AMD? Does cataract surgery increase the risk of developing AMD? And if so, is that association due to confounding by indication? That is, is it really primarily the association with cataract that precedes cataract surgery? Or is there a genuine increased risk attributable to the surgical procedure itself? And that, I think, is the real issue. Um, so this presentation will focus on AMD across the range of severity. Um, the, I think it's well accepted that the risk of late lesions is probably strongly associated um, <clears throat> with the presence of the earlier lesions and that it's a continuum. Um, and including all levels of severity increases the sample size and thus greater power to examine the association. And uh, so the relationships that I'll show you today reflect mostly, by virtue of the size of the sample, the associations with early AMD. I'm going to talk about a study that I know uh, like the back of my hand. Um, it's the Beaver Dam Eye Study. Um, the study um, initially uh, enumerated 5,924 people age 43 to 84 at the baseline examination um, that occurred between 1988 and 1990. 4,926 of these people participated in the examination at baseline. And there have been follow-up examinations every five years after the baseline exam, the most recent completed in uh, just 2010. Beaver Dam, as you can see from the map, uh, is about 39 miles northeast of Madison, Wisconsin, which is where uh, we are at at the university. And for those of you who don't know where Wisconsin is, it's that little red blip up there. Painted in red because of the Rose Bowl, which our football team won twice. Um, 
<laughs> the, the data in the eye study is collected by trained examiners. It takes us about six months to fully train an examiner. And, and um, they get information using standardized protocols on visual acuity, health history, family history, many lifestyle factors, medication use, and we have anthropomorphic measurements as well. Um, lab specimens uh, were taken at baseline from urine and blood. In addition, um, the pupils are dilated and stereoscopic 30 degree fundus photos are taken of the seven standard fields. Um, actually, seven standard fields only in people with diabetes, otherwise modified um, uh, fields one, two, and three. It, um, that might be familiar to you from the ETDRS protocol. Um, a slit lamp examination is done, and both slit lamp and retroillumination photos are taken to identify presence of cataract uh, type and ultimately used to grade for severity. I'm just going to run through very quickly what we're calling AMD. You've seen a number of different definitions, although they're all quite similar. Despite the distortion of the picture, you can tell. Um, this would be AMD level one, which is essentially a normal retina with no large drusen or pigment changes. Um, we circle where the macula is um, just for convenience. This would be level two, and there are, uh, you'll see different ways to get to the same level, um, where you can see small areas of soft drusen, but there are no pigment changes, even on careful exam with a, with a, view, a magnifying viewer. This would be level three, where you can see soft drusen, but you also see, with the help of the arrow, maybe it doesn't project quite so well, um, that there's a bit of in increased pigment or, and pigment clumping there. Level four, um, you can see, is more severe, large area of soft drusen with quite a bit of increased pigment and also depigmentation areas. Um, and this would be level five. This would be our most severe level, one way to get there is to have multifocal areas of geographic atrophy where the fovea is preserved and you might not have profound loss of vision with this. Um, here's central geographic atrophy. Again, um, there you can see the patches of, or the large patch really of, of uh, missing retina and in this case the fovea is affected. Um, and uh, this is a photo also level five uh, where we have exudative changes consisting of pigment epithelial detachment, subretinal hemorrhage, and subretinal fibrosis and scarring. To just walk you through um, the way we classify cataract, this is a slit lamp photo um, which uh, the pupils dilated, the light beam comes in at a 45 degree angle, and the, the camera's straight ahead. And uh, so this is a photograph of nuclear cataract um, which occurs in, in the nucleus or the center of the lens. This is an example using, this is a red reflex photo. The camera's backed out, but the, the light and the camera are straight ahead just to highlight for you what it looks like at the slit lamp for the ophthalmologist and for those who might be more familiar with placing the eye uh, between the lids. At any rate, you can see the black uh, lines in it. That's, uh, those are in the cortex. It's um, often called cortical spokes. Usually they go from the center, or from the periphery into the center, much, much as this is. And uh, this photograph was taken with the same sort of technique and the same camera, but here you see a large, um, what appears to be a plaque, we'll say, um, and the posterior subcapsular area that's just in front of the back of the lens. Um, posterior subcapsular cataract is the rarest kind of cataract that we see um, and is m most often uh, associated with um, vi visual symptoms. Okay, to go a little further, and that is to go into cataract surgery, um, the cataract, when an opacity is severe enough to interfere significantly with vision, is removed. Um, the methods of cataract surgery have changed in order to make it less traumatic and to improve visual results even in the last, well, since I learned how to do cataract surgery. Um, earlier methods used larger incisions than, than are done presently, and they've been getting smaller and smaller. Prior to 1980, the lens was removed and the individual was then given a spectacle correction uh, which had a lot of problems and that spectacle was in front of the eye. But beginning in the 80s, the use of intraocular lenses became rather widespread um, and the surgical techniques changed. Uh, since that time, there have been frequent changes in lens design and in the materials they're made of um, and uh, also the, the 
tools to attempt to have a smaller incision. This is just a, a, a copy diagram for those people who are not familiar. Um, nowadays, a, a, a small, um, either a, a, a knife blade of, of a specific type or a bent tip of a, <clears throat> of a syringe needle is put into the anterior chamber. Um, a cut is made. Let's see if I can get this to work right. Oh, wrong, that's wrong. Um, let's see if I can get it here. Well, at any rate, uh, at your upper right, you can see a cut being made in the anterior lens capsule. The surgeon strips it away, puts in a large instrument, as you see, over to your left um, that has an, has an ultrasound probe, breaks up the lens and extracts it with suction. And then um, now, nowadays, most commonly, an intraocular lens is implanted. This is actually an older technique. The incision's rather large. These days, the incision's much smaller, about three millimeters. Foldable and soft lenses are now used. Um, the original substances were more like polymethyl methacrylate, so the kind of plastics changed. <clears throat> Nowadays, it's an acrylic. Um, so, to cut to the chase now, which is the uh, analysis of the data we have, I'm going to use the five-step severity scale, examples of which I've already shown you. And for cataract, for this presentation, I'm including any kind of cataract, um, and then cataract surgery, as we showed. Okay, at the baseline exam in Beaver Dam, um, you can see the overlapping of the number of uh, cases of, um, of cataract. And uh, cataract, uh, nuclear cataract was the most common, followed closely behind by cortical, posterior subcapsular, as I mentioned, was the rarest. But in many cases, they overlap, and, and I will have more than one kind of cataract. Um, for those who only had nuclear cataract, there were 330, cortical cataract 387, as I mentioned, posterior subcapsula 70, but any cataract, if you um, choose that, uh, occurred in 994 people. So we have much greater uh, ability to detect a relationship if we use any cataract. And uh, in, in the current analyses, cataract type was not important, despite the fact that there appeared to be a, a greater effect with nuclear in the past. The question that I will look at is, does cataract occur concurrently with AMD? Does it pre precede AMD? And if so, does it affect the progression? First thing we'll look at is the cross-sectional data. The, the first snapshot we took when we were done with the uh, initial exam, where uh, they were both assessed at the same exam, and we used that data to get a measure of association. Um, but, of course, you can't tell which came first. So this is just a diagram to say these are the possible scenarios. Everybody increases with increasing age. In the first case, we find AMD later. In the second case, we have AMD and cataract. Cross-sectionally, we can't tell which came first. The diagram suggests a temporal relationship, which is what we think might be true, but, but who knows. Um, and and cross-sectional data won't help you out much. And then below that are the other scenarios, cataract first, then cataract surgery, and then lo and behold, AMD. Or in the last case, where we can't tell very well, cataract and AMD may be present. If the cataract is dense enough, it's difficult to evaluate the retina. Um, you do cataract surgery to take it out. You see AMD. Who knows um, which came first, the cataract or the AMD? We only know that um, it was discovered after surgery. <clears throat> So this is analysis of our very first examination data. It's cross-sectional analyses. You can see that in people without cataract, about 11% had some AMD. Those people who had any amount of cataract had a higher prevalence of AMD, 25% or 26%. People had cataract surgery, a smaller group for sure, but nearly 29% of them had AMD present. And across the bottom, you can see the same data displayed as a bar chart with increasing cataract, or the highest uh, rate of cataract in those who had had cataract surgery. Um, hmm. Something is missing here. <laughs> um, at any rate, the point is that you can't tell what the temporal association is between the two in that kind of data. Oh, here it is, sorry. Um, you can see that um, no cataract being the reference group, those who had at least one cataract type had a 25% increased uh, risk of having AMD. For cataract surgery, it was 1.31. Um, the the p-value for that was not significant, partly due to the fact that there are not as many people. And this is controlled 
for what we found to be relevant confounders, including age, gender, and then we looked at a, a number of other things. Uh, I'm sorry for, <laughs> for some of these. I had an intended fancy uh, effect, but my statistician was helping me out. Um, so the point about this is just to remind you what the difference between um, cross-sectional and incidence data. People are only eligible to be incident AMD cases if they had no sign of it at baseline. So for follow-up, we're looking at people who had no AMD and then the first um, uh, set down where you can see no AMD early and late, um, in our case, is five years later, but the point being it's incidence. And each time we go on and on, if we're looking at incidents, we can look at incidents in the group that was spared in the interval before. Um, so we um, described the limitations of um, Cross-sectional data, adding temporal sequence um, is, of course, important. Um, also, the time between observations, as you'll see, may be an important thing. So um, in the beginning, in the first simplest model, since we have 20 years data, we looked at cataract status at the baseline and incidence over the entire 20-year period. And um, that's convenient and easy to do and easy to understand. And doing it that way, you can see that we found that if people had any cataract at all at the baseline exam, 1988 to 90, um, they had a 36% chance of developing AMD by the 20-year follow-up. If they had cataract surgery present at the baseline exam, the odds ratio was 1.64. Once again, across the bottom, you see the bar charts essentially um, uh, showing the, the difference in rates. But it, it's sort of parallel to what we saw before. Well, the limitations of that very simple incidence model, um, because then we only control for the factors at baseline exam, 20 years before, um, cataract, but as well as all the other things, age, gender, and so on. Um, if cataract status changes over time, this could affect the relationships. We wouldn't pick it up in a 20-year window because it's, it's too far apart. And it also, that analysis ignores the time to event when, when AMD first um, becomes apparent. So we next uh, model both the outcome and the predictive variables over time. And so that uh, has an added advantage of being able to include people who may miss a visit. Those people would drop out if they miss the 20 year visit, but if we have multiple visits in between because we see them every five years, they contribute to the analysis and that increases the power of the data. So this is just um, another diagram of possible scenarios, people who had no cataract at baseline, some cataract, cataract surgery, and then the, the potential different things that could happen. Those without cataract might develop cataract, then surgery, then have AMD noticed. Those who had um, cataract at the beginning, then cataract surgery and AMD later. I mean, any scenario you can think of has happened, and with the data I've presented so far, you don't know that. All, all, all I've showed you is the cataract variables at baseline and what happened AMD-wise, but here we have the time sequence. Um, what we do is we model it in five-year chunks. Uh, so here we go. Um, this uses multiple five-year intervals by cataract status at the beginning of the interval. And so using this way, um, we get a somewhat different impression. The other thing that we update is not just the cataract status every five years, but all the things that you thought were important um, for cataract, like smoking, like... Um, well, of course, change in age. Um, and, and actually, it's age square, so that's an important thing to consider. At any rate, using this model, you can see that we still find an effect, although no longer significant, uh, for cataract. But for cataract surgery, it's 1.43. That is significant. Um, so in the time that updated model, using cataract or cataract surgery at one visit to predict incidence of AMD in the next interval, strengthens our uh, uh, ability to look at things. Well, another way to look at this data is, is to look at the effect on progression of AMD. Um, and that's a, another, I think, important way to try and get a handle on the importance of cataract and or cataract surgery. Um, progression, um, if, if you will agree, with, I'll say, my or our interpretation, and that is once you're on the slippery slope, 
you, you tend to move along, and they are a continuum, as opposed to um, only end-stage AMD being important. But defining progression is, is um, not a trivial affair either. We present and are using currently a five-step big chunk severity scale. But when you want to look at this um, uh, statistically, how will you define progression? Would it be one step along the scale? Would it be two? If you use one step, AMD is a variable phenomenon. Um, it it, it appa appears to regress sometimes. Sometimes that's due to changes in photography, but sometimes it appears to be real. Um, one might feel more comfortable using a two-step change. That's a big chunk change. Um, <clears throat> uh, we also had to deal with, um, as I said, real progression and grading artifacts. That's not just photography, other things that may um, come into play. Um, the other thing that we need to think about is whether we want to include um, multiple steps of progression. Don't forget, we've seen people over many exams, they might be getting worse and worse, they might not, they might have cataract in one time, have cataract surgery by the next, how do you uh, model this? Um, and um, as I said uh, before, which is still important, um, is that if we use the baseline exam as our beginning, we also don't use some other information that I'll show you that's, um, that may help to understand progression and the, what appears to be a disparity from cataract surgery at baseline to cataract surgery later on. So in the model I'll present to you, I'm using the big chunks. That is two steps on the five-step scale. For example, level one, no AMD to level three, which um, it, it is approaching what you find in the ARID study. For level four, which is already pretty severe, we accept one step. You go to the most severe level uh, with that. Um, and we're examining progression uh, from baseline um, as well to visit by visit um, and in some cases I'll show you even from history we have from before. So this is the five-year progression over the 20-year interval um, that we found and uh, you can see that people who had one had cataract, one or more, had a 24% increased risk of developing AMD. This is of borderline significance. For cataract surgery, it's stepping right up there. Now we're up to 1.51, which is significant. Now, as I mentioned, we have some historical information where we have dates of surgery uh, prior to the first exam as well. Um, and only, only if you're very sure, in my view, that the history of exposure is solid and real and you can document it should you consider using historical information. Don't forget, people don't remember very well, for example, nutritional things in the past. Um, and cataract surgery is a bit better. People remember when they've had a knife in their eye. But um, if you want the date of cataract surgery, you, you need to have pretty much hard data. So um, including that historical data, we find this. People who had one cataract or more had a 24% increase. People who had cataract surgery five years ago had uh, about a 32% increase. Not a great change, but note the direction. People who had surgery more than five years ago had the highest risk of going on to develop AMD, and that is significant. So there's something suggestive here. Um, now, when the assumption in the modeling I just showed you is that we look at five years to five years, but maybe that's not long enough. Don't forget, um, those of you who are clinicians will know that people who have been involved in fisticuffs in their youth and sustained an injury to the eye may develop cataract in that eye sooner than the fellow eye. Not immediately, but it appears to accelerate the progression. So the notion here is that it's possible with an insult like cataract surgery that you need a longer time before you can see an effect. So we looked at progression of cataract um, by the time that we measured cataract. In other words, if you had, how long does it take after the appearance of cataract or cataract surgery? Can we find progression of AMD? Um, and again, we used our two-step level, and you can see that if we do this, and we use 10-year progression as our um, outcome, there is an increased risk associated with cataract, but now the risk associated with cataract surgery is much increased. And this is, these odds ratios are statistically significantly different from each other. So, 
my brief sum up. Uh, we've examined many approaches to understanding the associations of cataract and cataract surgery to AMD in the population-based cohort that's now been followed for 20 years, and I can tell you the follow-up has been very good, except for the effects of the Grim Reaper. We couldn't get away from that. Um, all of our models confirm what appears to be a temporal sequence of cataract or cataract surgery to incidence and progression of AMD. Um, and updating the cataract variables and other covariates is more, I think, biologically appropriate because people's habits as well as effective aging changes, genes get turned on and off at different ages. And so I think that's a much more appropriate model. Um, so when, when, and when it's possible or appropriate in progression analyses as compared to incidents, um, increasing the events using this technique um, is important and it may permit you to, to line up the events. In other words, cataract, cataract surgery, AMD. Um, this sort of model development, to get back to the purpose of this conference initially, um, can be applied to using to nutritional data too, especially in observational studies and uh, in use of supplements. And I think the updating may be uh, informative. Um, uh, it's especially useful, as I said, in observational studies, but it can also be applied to long-term clinical trials, for example, such as the ARIDS, um, because the models can accommodate change that, that could be very important with regard to the outcome. And I think this is likely to improve the reliability and validity of the results. Thanks.